Welcome. We're going to jump right into Ephesians chapter 4, verses 31 and 32. And uh, these are extremely important verses. I wanted to tell you, in our church, a couple of people have come and they've begun clearing out some of the thing that we've accumulated here. We've been in this building. The church has been here for 56 years. And in that time, there's a lot of stuff that's, that's stacked up. We're going to have a word of prayer, and then I want to tell you some of the things about that. Lord, thank you for what you've given. As we talk about clearing out, letting it go, help us to be faithful, to listen, and to be obedient, to do what you've called on us to do. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Do you like to declutter? Do you like to get rid of things? Well, these people that were clearing out our attic began to pull stuff out of there, and they brought out window blinds that we no longer use. They brought out old sound equipment. They brought down old files and records from back when our church had a school here. Um, they have found two overhead projectors that were used in the old days as teaching aids. They found carbon paper and office supplies. And it's reported there's even a 16 millimeter movie camera up there, movie projector up there. And uh, they're cleaning out and making room. And it feels pretty good to get that clean. I got to thinking about that. What if you were to... <laughs> And I'm sorry, this is just my, the way my mind works. But what if you took each of those things and you applied it to something in our lives? For instance, say that you're cleaning out your own attic. The old records, you could you could say, well, that is like old memories that we need to get rid of. Old wounds and old times when something's hurt us or something's not uh, building us up. We need to get rid of those things. Or that projector. Maybe we could liken that to things we've seen in the past. It's hard to get those pictures out of our heads. Maybe they need to be tossed. How about the old sound equipment? Of course, that's things we've heard in the past that need to be gotten rid of. Or those old blinds, that since they come down over the window so you can't see, you could compare those to past ignorance, being closed-minded and not being open to learning what we should. The carbon paper, you could liken that to repeated habits, things that you are doing again and again, because carbon paper makes copies of what you trace over. The old overhead projectors and teaching aids you could look at as the old way we used to do things, the old habits and the old manner that we were used to that we should probably give up, or the old office equipment, think about about the very things you've done in the past in which you, you, uh, you don't need to do those those way anymore. You can let go and learn new things. So you can take these and draw a whole comparison about these these things. Well, then we get to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 31, where Paul is saying, do this. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. All right, declutter, he says. It's time to get rid of those things that don't belong. In a practical believer's life, we're supposed to unload those things. And so he lists them out. The first word is bitterness. Let all bitterness be gone. And the word here comes from a Greek word that means something is bitter and sharp. Now, the bitter is a pungent smell or taste. <laughs> Some people liken that to extremely aged cheese. And... Uh, Something sharp is something that pierces, like a thorn or an arrow. Listen to what it says in Hebrews 12 and verse 15. See to it that no one comes short of the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springing up causes trouble, and by it many be defiled. When someone is, has bitterness inside that's held on to, it, it's tied to being dissatisfied and not content and unthankful. It's used, used uh, it, it, it's truly a defect in our attitude. We're, we're, uh, it's closely related to someone being unable to give God thanks. And one of the things we're told to do constantly is to thank God. It came to refer a long-standing resentment and a spirit that refuses to be reconciled. Remember that in Ephesians 4, we look back at verse 26, where it says, don't hold on to your anger beyond that day's sunset. Don't let the sun go down on your wrath. Well, bitterness is a settled hostility in a person that poisons the whole inner self. Bitterness leads to wrath, which is the outward explosion of the inner feelings. Um, in Colossians chapter 3 and verse 19, it says, 
Husbands, love your wives and do not be embittered against them. Why do you think Paul thought he had to tell husbands that they're not to be bitter against this person that's supposed to be the one they love most in the world? Because people can hold resentments and be bitter. And he said, don't do that. Love each other. Don't hold bitterness towards each other. And then in 1 Corinthians 13 and verse 5, as it's describing what the love of God is like and the love we're supposed to be exercising, it says, love does not keep or remember past wrongs and that feeling of resentment and, and being irritated by them. It lets go of that. It doesn't remember. It doesn't record and keep records, putting a notch in your stick every time you got offended so that you never forget them. Well, our tendency is to hold on to those things, but the love of God says, no, you don't pay attention to those. Let them go. You don't need to carry those around. Bitterness. Put it away. The next word he writes is wrath. Wrath is a hot, flaring anger, angry outburst. It's the anger that boils over. It comes from a Greek word, thumos, and it, it, it reminds you of the word thermal. And it, it, is, uh, it, it means it boils over. It causes us to act hotly, wildly, carelessly. For instance, when someone spouts off and they say, well, it's not my fault, I was angry. As if that's an excuse. That's not an excuse. That's a terrible admission that your anger can control you so you can't keep in what shouldn't be said. Flaring anger. We may describe some people as being like dealing with a porcupine. And you think about, <laughs> we had a big dog out in the village that a couple times got into porcupines. And he didn't get in real bad. He was smart enough not to just bury his face in them. But he'd come and he'd have these white quills sticking out. And I'd have to grab him by the head and pull those quills out. They're awful. I got the, I got the other end of one in my own finger one time. And they have hooked barbs. When you, anyway, when you deal with a porcupine, it's hard not to get poked. Sometimes we describe people that way. Don't fly off the handle easily. Don't be the one that people avoid so they won't get their head bitten off. This smoldering readiness to be angry shouldn't be the attitude that we carry about in life. If we're in Christ, that wrath should be put away. But then the very next thing is anger. Now, in English, we think of wrath and anger as very similar to each other, but it's not so. The anger that it's talking about is a persistent anger that becomes a habit. Not righteous, but human anger. James 1 and verse 20 says, For man's anger does not accomplish God's righteousness. Did you ever know someone who could get angry at the drop of a hat, and so they carried their own hat so they could drop it so they could get angry quicker? We used to talk about people like that that seemed like they always were cocked and ready for a fight. And this is someone who's not necessarily full of rage all the time, but there's no safety on their, on them that, that causes them to be checked. They're ready to get angry immediately. Um, like carrying a firearm. I don't know if you use firearms, but if you do, a firearm with the safety off, ready to fire, you don't just put that in your pocket and go walking around with it. It's dangerous. It can do damage. Well, the same thing is so when we have, uh, a ready anger that's just ready to go off at any time. A response in anger can become a habit. It can get so we're ready to snap at somebody. And you may have seen families in which people have um, come to that place with each other that they're ready to snap. They always are expecting someone's going to cut me down, criticize me, belittle me, make me feel bad. So I'm going to cut them off, at, you know, in return. That's what this anger is. It's that quick Readiness to be angry. But then it goes on. It says, says uh, let bitterness, wrath, anger, and clamor. What do you think of when you think of clamor? Do you think of noise? Think of raising a ruckus? Well, this is someone who's quick to blow up and yell and cause a scene. Ready to get in a fight. They're contentious. They don't have any caution. It keeps down the noise and the commotion and the uproar. Being touchy so you can be set off into a loud outburst. Believers shouldn't be loud, obnoxious, annoying people quick to jump into a quarrel or to cause an uproar. And yet, I've got relatives who, if things get calm after a little while, they do something awful just to stir things up because they get tired of it being so smooth. I don't. I wish they'd just quit. But I'm telling you that Christians can get into the habit 
of being ready and having no stops. They're going to blow sky high. They're going to holler when they ought to be quiet. And it says that not ought not to be. After it talks about clamor, it goes on and says, and slander. Slander is, is a Greek word, blasphemia. Does that remind you of anything? It means abusive language. Being quick to give a bad report about someone. Christians ought not to be gossip bearers that are wanting to tell everybody the juicy details of how someone messed up. Pointing out faults and tearing at someone with your words. You're assuming you have the right to pass judgment on them, to point out their failings and criticize them to others and find fault with what they're doing. To give the lowest report about a brother or sister in Christ. Get rid of that. It's not supposed to be a part of you. You're not the judge. God is. Let him take care of that. You speak good about each other. Make it your point to find something to be thankful for. And then after after the slander, it says uh, to put all that away from you along with all malice. Malice is ill will. That means a desire for the harm or bad to happen to someone. Romans 15 verses 1 and 2 says this. Now we who are strong have an obligation to bear the weaknesses of those without strength and not to please ourselves. Each one of us must please his neighbor for his good to build him up. Our aim should not be the tearing down of somebody, not to delight in their fall, but to build them up. This word malice is in some places translated just straight across as evil. And it's when it's harbored, it affects your attitude towards people. It makes a sour outlook. It gives you an evil view of life and of the folks that are in it. Having it in for someone, hoping and, and, and helping the, them to fall. Does that sound like that's Christ? Does that sound like the thing that the Lord would encourage? No. So that's why Paul says, get them out of here. Chuck them out. Throw them in the burn bell and get rid of them good and all. Let go of these things, he says. Clean them out. Just like we've been cleaning out the church attic. Colossians 3 and verse 8 says it again. Paul also wrote this. He said, but now you also put them all aside. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and abusive speech from your mouth. Don't do that, he says. Instead, we're told in verse 32, Ephesians 4, verse 32, but be kind to each other, tenderhearted, forgiving each other, even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. Again, we're going to break these down into the elements that he says. It says to be kind. Now, this kindness is not just a generic niceness where you always have a smile on your face and it's hard to get you riled. Instead, it's directed, applied kindness done towards someone. Being gentle and patient and friendly so that you're approachable. Let kindness be the flavor of your life. The opposite of harsh and hard and sharp and bitter. Kindness operates from a wisdom that comes from God. James 3 and verse 17 says, But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peace-loving, gentle, reasonable, full of mercy and good fruits, good produce from that, unwavering, without hypocrisy. It's steady and genuine. That's what it says about the kindness the, the wisdom that comes from God. It's marked by kindness. And when someone speaks and they want to set you straight and tell you what, if it doesn't come across with a gentle kindness, you need to pay real close attention. Say, well, is that right or not? Because the Spirit speaks it in gentleness. He knows that we need to be corrected in a way that will urge us toward what's good, not put us up ready to fight as soon as someone opens their mouth about it. So he says, be kind. Then he says to be tender hearted. It literally means having strong, healthy insides, healthy bowels, is, is what it literally says. And the reason is, the, the Greeks used to consider that the inner organs were the place where the emotions and intentions came from. In other words, think about yourself. Think about how your insides feel when you're really filled with strong emotion, whether it's fear or anger or whatever. You stop to think about it. Your stomach can clench up. Your heart races, your breathing accelerates, your intestines cramp. All of these things can come from those 
strong emotions. He says, be tender-hearted. It came to mean then compassion, gr quickly moving to love and concern for someone and sorrow for someone who is hurting. To be tender-hearted is to be sensitive to others' needs and feeling for them, to have tender attention to someone who needs your attention. There's so many hurting people in the world. The tender-hearted acceptance, not of their sin, but of them as a person is one of the things that shows you are Christ and being led by the Holy Spirit. So be kind to each other, tenderhearted. Then it says forgiving each other. First consider, there's going to be occasions when you it will require a, a response from you because someone's done something to you or against you or said something about you. The one called for from us, even when someone is offended us, is to forgive. Here's how uh, this is so opposite to the list we just went through in verse 31. Note the standard our forgiveness is to be measured by is Christ's own grace. You see this repeated in Colossians 3 verses 12 through 14 where it says, so, as those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another, being patient with each other, and forgiving each other, whoever has a complaint against anyone. Remember, when you have the complaint against when you have a complaint against someone, this word says, be forgiving. Whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you, beyond all these things, put on love, which is a perfect bond of unity. Do you recall the story of Joseph? I'm going to give you the reference. I'm not going to turn there. In Genesis chapter 50, chapter 50, the very last chapter. Now, there's been a long years go by in the last few chapters of Genesis. Joseph's brothers have sold him into slavery, hoping he'll die there. They chose that way instead of just killing him outright. And they, they sent him off as a slave. He went down. He was mistreated. He was falsely accused when his boss claimed that he, that his wife claimed that, that Joseph had tried to attack her. He was thrown into prison for years. He was there and finally was led out and brought into the Pharaoh and was made the grand vizier, the, the head of all of Egypt in the distribution of their their food and, and, and welfare campaign. And his brothers came from Canaan to Egypt because they were out of food up there too. They came down. He recognized them immediately. They didn't recognize this starkly Egyptian guy that was, that was over them. And he put him through some tests and then finally revealed who he was. They sent away, got his father and the rest of the family, brought him, all of them set up in Egypt. And things went along until their dad died. And then all the brothers started saying, uh-oh, now dad's not there to protect us. Joseph's going to try to take out on us all that frustration and anger he had. And so they came to him and they said, before dad died, he said you should forgive us for what we did. And he said, what? You still are worried about that? He says, I'm not going to hold that against you. It's God that brought me down here. You meant it for evil, but God meant it for good to save many lives. He said, of course, I'm not going to hold it against you. It was God who was at work and all that. And Joseph had the heart big enough to say, why would I hold on to resentment? I went the way God had me go, and I wouldn't have it any other way. Forgiving each other is special here. In Colossians 3, where we were just reading in verse 13, I want you to look at something. There's a term there. It said um, that we're to forgive each other. And that phrase is very interesting because it includes, in that one Greek word, it means forgiving both yourself and the person with whom you have the problem. So this includes the idea that you need to forgive yourselves as well as forgive others. Sometimes we feel like we've got a pretty good attitude because, yes, we're willing to forgive others, but we hold against ourselves failures of the past, things that we don't like about ourselves, stuff that is uh, weighing on us, perhaps guilt for past action. But when it says forgiving each other, it says forgiving yourself and 
all the others as well. And that's an important for us to do, to truly experience the full grace of Christ's forgiveness so we don't limit how we forgive others. We freely and completely forgive because we freely understand how thoroughly God has forgiven us. And knowing that changes your attitude. It changes your outlook against someone else who is offended even against you. You realize, well, compared to my offense against God, and he forgave me completely, and he is my Savior, he indwells me, I want to forgive in the same way. I don't want to put limits on how far grace will go. He gave his grace to me freely. I give his grace freely. I forgive. I don't hold resentment. I open up to and willingly forgive. Now, because we live in a time when so many people are walking around, around with wounds because someone has hurt us, it's very easy to think, well, but you don't know how bad it was. You don't know what I went through. You don't know and on and on and on. And I have to tell you this, Paul doesn't qualify it. God's word does not say, well, you got quite a bit of grace, but do your best. It says, freely forgive because it's measured by the way God forgave you. If he freely cleaned you up and forgave you from all your sin, then what sin is there that's not big enough for you to forgive? Or what is too big for you to forgive? What is it that you will think you can give God the excuse, well, I had a right to be resentful there. You think so? You think that you can say to God, well, that was just too big an offense. How big was it that you caused Christ to be nailed to a cross and die and pour out his blood for you? That forgiveness knows no bounds. And so he says to you, if you are Christ's, don't let your forgiveness have boundaries. Let it be wide open. Forgive freely as he forgave you. Be kind to each other. Be tender-hearted, sensitive. Forgive each other in the very same way that God in Christ has forgiven you. This is good. This is some of the best there is. If you have not yet memorized chapter 4, verse 32, you do that and go by it and let it guide you as you go about your life and as you deal with things that hurt and things that have disappointed and things that you feel like you didn't get your fair share of what should have been given and, and on and on. There's so many ways we can look at life and find something to be upset about. Be kind. Be tenderhearted. Forgive each other in the very same way that Christ forgave you. We're going to stop there. Next time we'll go on to chapter 5, if God gives us that time together. If the Lord comes back, we'll just meet there and let him tell us about it. So that'll be good. God bless you. Let's pray. Father, this is really good. What you have said, this is supposed to be the flavor of believers. As they walk with the Lord, they demonstrate towards each other the truth of God's forgiveness and the truth of how you greatly have poured on the, the forgiveness and the grace. That word grace, the unearned favor, it isn't up to other people to measure up to whether they deserve us to give grace. We want to give it freely because God gave it freely to us. Help us to be able to do that. Let that mark us so that people cannot deny that we are Christ's because of the presence of that forgiveness and grace that comes from us, because it comes from you in us, because it's what your design is that we be. That's a freeing kind of a grace. Those things that we hold as resentments anchor us down. They're like being hemmed in. Help us to live free because you have given us freely that forgiveness. Love and praise you, Lord. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Keep on going. God calls you to a high standard of living, to a great gift of, of uh, goodness. Experience it. It's not make-believe. It's not something that isn't true. It's absolutely true, and he expects it to be practical in our life. So don't give up. Don't quit. Next time we'll go on. Keep reading. See you then.